So we're sitting here in the Knowledge Quarter in London. Just immediately north of us, there is DeepMind, there's Google, there's Facebook, there's also all of the surrounding technologies of the Alan Turing Institute and many departments who work in human-computer interaction. Now, whether you're with us in the hall or whether you're joining us online, I think we can all agree that we're in an age of unprecedented advance in digital technology. So what does that mean for our futures? How will that transform our lives? Well, we're always within arm's length of a smartphone, and that's created new ways of socializing, not always good. And when people don't take photos of us, we take photos of ourselves. So this is how we're living our lives, and some people are very worried about this. Without a terrific amount of evidence, we have some senior scientists saying, if children are alone too much in front of screens, if children are not communicating with others, they'll become reclusive, they'll lack empathy, they will become unconnected to other human beings. Well, this isn't a new problem. We had that when we had children who spent a lot of time in their rooms reading books. But the world of books is still the world, and a lot of those children went on to be functioning academics. Now, people also talk about things we've lost. There's a lot of worry that when we lose the feel of a book in our hands, the turning of the pages, capabilities are disappearing. But other capabilities are being born. We swipe. We've learned that. Now, of course, that leads to a different way of reacting to the world. And I've heard that some children, when they go in and look at glass exhibits in museums, try to expand the exhibit with their fingers. So, so we are changing. But although we have got all this wonderful digital technology around us, we have to remember not everybody is the beneficiary of it. There is still in the world a huge digital divide between those who have access and easy access to this and those who don't. And even in developed countries, there is still digital poverty. And we saw that during the pandemic, people who couldn't have access to laptops and to internet so easily. But for those of us who do, we now have this fantastic opportunity to not just see paintings, we can walk into paintings, we can be in those worlds. We have concerts with greater and greater immersive experience attached to them. We even have digital ABBA. Now, digital ABBA is great because it takes these people with motion sensors and hologram technology and turns them into this. So it's the digital fountain of youth. How wonderful. But what does all this mean for our, our past, our present, and our future in the digital sphere? Well, I want us to be cautious, and I think we should remember this wonderful line from a colleague, historian, Jeff Krosick, who says, each generation believes its own technological achievements are unprecedented. Each generation is wrong. So let's remind ourselves of that, and how many times we've been through amazing transformations. If we go back to antiquity, you have to remember that originally people could only read by speaking the words aloud. Monasteries were noisy places where there's a lot of whispering as they read and transcribed the texts. It was this man, Ambrose, who discovered the trick of reading silently by not actually enunciating the words, just, just keeping it in. And they tested him read this text, can you tell what's there? And here you have uh, St. Augustine talking about it. His eyes ran over the columns of writing and his heart searched out the meaning, but his voice and his tongue were at rest. Amazing. So that was a new transformation. We've always had these. And I think the transformation we'd like now is if we could make it possible for people to respond to their mobile phone calls silently. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could send the signals from the language centers and the motor areas directly to the other person's phones and the rest of us could remain in peace and quiet while phone conversations were taking place? Something we can dream of. But right now, and indeed for quite a while, we've been using digital technology to deal with problems that we encounter. Sensory substitution, when we lose some of our senses, in blindness, Bakirita looked at the possibility of converting signals from a camera 
to sensations transmitted to your back so that people could eventually learn to feel an object was looming towards them? Can we use sound to recreate the world around us? Not just the world, but the shape and the orientation of objects in our environment. It's, it's, it's being pioneered as we, as we speak. Cochlear implants are an amazing thing too, where you can pulse signals, an array of signals to the auditory cortex, and then the brain can learn to reconstruct the noise around the person. And this man, Neil Harbison, visited uh, our lab. He's colorblind and he's got a cemented in camera and device which allows him to take signals from the light refracting surfaces around him so he can feel what colors are in the objects around him. We might even have sensory extension and enhance our abilities. So every time the heart beats, it sends a signal to the brain. And in fact, you have an emotional signature given by the change in heart rate and how that expresses itself in our bodies. And when we have those changes in heart rate, we have a slight pulse of blood to the face. And so people are developing glasses where you could read off that change in face so you could see people's emotions. Do we want that? And of course, VR is a huge promise. We can belong to a world of virtual reality, a, a different world. We can inhabit a different space. But ask yourself the question, why hasn't this technology just taken over? Why don't we have it everywhere? Why don't we use it more and more? Well, part of the problem is that when you've got a complicated environment you're seeing, unless you get the timing right between the optical flow of information and the vestibular systems in your ears that tell you whether you're going side to side, back to front, up or down, you can get motion sickness. It's quite difficult to overcome this because our senses talk to each other. They don't work in isolation. So maybe we want AR. I mean, you could go to a historical site and see a ruin, and by holding up your screen, you could see it recreated while still having the air on your face and the smell of the ground and the earth around you. But people want technologies that put us in a different world, that immerse us in a different world. But it's not enough to do that visually. So we worked with some gamers who realized pretty quickly that when you move, as you'll do today, from one room to another, through corridors, into another space, there's a different acousmatic for each room you're in. And your ears are picking that up even though you're not consciously attending to it. So when you're in a digital space created visually for you, if we can co coordinate those changes in sounds, people feel a greater sense of presence. So could we then just add the other senses one by one? Masks that give us smell. Could we have vibrators to increase touch? Some of my colleagues have been working on that with Oculus and Quest. Now, it's a, it's a technical challenge, an engineering challenge, to, to provide real-time information from data that you're gathering through artificial sensors and from, from remote sensing of, of things in our environment and make sure it's fitted to us, human-centered, and that we're able to use that information in real-time quickly and fluidly. Now, imagine that's all done. Do we then find ourselves more and more inclined to be in this alternative virtual space? Well, we've had that experiment. When the pandemic struck and we were confined to our homes in lockdown, we were relying more and more on technology. We spent a lot of time in meetings like this. But what we longed for was to get out into the empty streets, to feel the air, to feel the buildings around us. We wanted to walk in nature. People talked about being able to smell their neighbor's gardens and hear birdsong. It was very important, very special to us. So why would we want to put ourselves into an alternative reality, which is so believable, so satisfying, and so good that we could inhabit that as much and as well as we do the world we're in. Why do we want to be in the metaverse? Well, according to Mark Zuckerberg, this is where we will go to meet socially and even to work in that social space. But where are the tea and biscuits? Well, maybe we could digitally create them. I mean, after all, we eat first with our eyes, or these days we eat first with our mobile phones. So maybe we could sort of present the image, but nothing will replace putting food into real mouths. If you really want that experience, it has to be direct contact. And what about smell? So smell is something that we could deliver to real noses. We could create artificial scents and we could release them and pulse them. 
But smell is very badly behaved, and it's extremely difficult to coordinate the timings between coming upon something in the world around you and the odors reaching you, which is why we don't have smell o vision or aroma-rama in the cinema, despite the fact that Disney tried it very unsuccessfully. And it's for that reason that we sometimes need to step back from our screens, from audiovisual information, and remember our other senses. I was interviewed by the artist Oliver Eliasson for his exhibition at Tate in real life, and he was talking to me about the work I do on taste and smell, and we've collaborated a little. And he said, I know what you are, you're part of the counter numbness movement. And I thought, what's that? He said, well, you're reminding us we're embodied, you're reminding us of our sensory experience. And I thought, yes, I want that t-shirt. And it reminds me that Oliver's work himself says, look, if you want to get information to, across to people, say about climate change, it's real contact with the real world that will make the difference. Wonderful exhibit called Ice Watch, where he had transported from Greenland broken off pieces of ice melt. He left them outside the square in Bloomberg in London, and you, you, you could actually touch the problem of climate change. You could feel them melting over seven days. That direct contact is more emotionally potent than images on a screen. And of course, the arts are good at giving us experiences that are not just visual. We want new experiences in art. We want to smell things. We want to feel things. And of course, our senses don't work one by one and independently. They merge. They talk to each other. They collaborate. The senses affect each other's working. When you see this image of food, you know what to expect by way of texture and taste. When you pick it up with your fingers, you know if something is sticky or soft or chewy or crunchy. You can think of this, the flavors and the aromas of fruits before they're in your mouth. And of course, tasting is multisensory. It's one of the most multisensory things we do. It combines taste, touch, smell, other senses to give us a unified experience of the flavor of foods. And it's not the exception, it's the rule. Most of our experience, in fact, all of our experience, unless very artificially created in a lab, is multisensory. We experience the world with all of our senses. So how many senses do we have? Well, philosophers used to say five, and maybe you say five, but my colleagues in neuroscience say, well, anywhere between 22 and 33. So what are these other senses? Well, close your eyes. You know where your limbs are, your hands and your feet, without looking or touching them. That's proprioception. You've got a sense of balance. The sense of touch is pain, heat, the feel of fabric and texture, many senses. Now, because the senses are working together, they conspire to give us our experience of ourselves and our environment and our place in that environment. When you go to a gallery, it's better than looking at an image on the screen of the artwork because you feel the space of the building around you. You smell the room you're in, you know the temperature. All of that matters, the experience you're having. And we must give up the idea that in the future, the whole of our pasts can be recorded digitally we have this idea, we'll have a digital record of our past. You know, you look at your phone and scroll through it, it's like your life flashing in front of you. But is it really like that? Because of course, a lot of things will be left out. You won't have the cool air of the night walk. You won't feel the pebbles under your feet. You won't hear the cry of the gulls. And that's why we have to remember that what can't be captured by the digital will always be essential. Thank you.